Today, I'm speaking with Matt Clancy, who runs Open Philanthropy's Innovation Policy Grantmaking Program and who's a senior fellow at Institute for Progress. Thanks for coming on, Matt. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. How could scientific progress be a net negative? I was like, obviously, this is the case. It's very frustrating that people don't think this is a given. But then I started to think like, you know, taking it as a given seems like a mistake. Um, and in my field, economics of innovation, it is sort of taken as a given. You know, science tends to almost always be good. Uh, you know, progress in technological innovation tends to be good. Maybe there's some exceptions with climate change, but we tend to not think about that as being a technology problem. It's more like a specific kind of technology is bad. But anyway, let me give you an example of like a concrete scenario that sort of is the seed of beginning to reassess and, and think it's interesting to like interrogate that underlying assumption. So, you know, suppose we make these grants, uh, we do some of those experiments I talk about, like we fund, we discover, for example, that if you, uh, I'm just making this up, but like, you know, we give we give people super forecasting tests when they're doing peer review and we find that you can identify people who are super good at picking science. And then, you know, we have this like much better targeted science and like we're making progress at like, I don't know, a 10% faster rate, you know, than mm -hmm. we normally would have. Over time that aggregates up and, you know, maybe after 10 years, we're like a year ahead of where we would have been if we hadn't done this kind of stuff. Now, suppose in 10 years, we're going to discover a cheap kind of new genetic engineering technology that anyone can use in the world uh, if they order the right parts off of Amazon. That could be great, but could also allow bad actors to genetically engineer pandemics and basically try to do terrible things with this technology. And if we've brought that forward, that happens at year nine instead of year 10 because of some of these interventions we did, well, now it starts to think like, well, if that's really bad, if the... Uh, if, if these people using this technology causes huge problems for humanity, it begins to sort of wash out the benefits of getting the science a little bit faster. And in fact, it could even be worse because like what if in year 10, we were also going to invent, you know, uh, that's when AGI happens, for example. Like we, we get a super AI and when that happens, the world is transformed. We might discuss later like why I have some skepticism that it will be so discreet but I think it's a possibility and so like if that happens maybe if that if we invented this cheap genetic engineering technology after that it's no risk the AI can tell oh yeah here's here's how you you know mitigate that problem but if the uh, if it comes available before that then maybe in the we never get to the AGI because somebody creates a super terrible virus that you know wipes out 99% of the population where some kind of YA dystopian apocalyptic future or something like that. <laughs> All right. So anyway, that's the sort of concrete scenario. And your uh, you know your instinct is to be like, oh, come on. But like uh, you start to think about it, and you're like, it could be. Uh, we invented nuclear weapons. Those were real. <laughs> they can lead to a dystopia, and like they could end civilization. There's no reason that science has to always play by the same rules and like just always be good for humanity. Things can change. And so I started to think it would be interesting to spend time interrogating this kind of uh, assumption and see if it's a blind spot for, for my field and for, for other people. Non-philosophical reasons to discount the far future. So remember, ultimately, we're sort of being like, what's the return on science? And there's a bunch of reasons why the return on science could change in the distant future. It could be that science develops in a way in the future such that the return on science changes dramatically. Like the, the, we reach a period where there's just like tons of crazy breakthroughs. So it's crazy valuable that we can do that faster. Or it could be that we enter this some worse version of this time of perils. And actually, like science is just always giving bad guys better weapons. And so like it's it's really bad. But there's a ton of other scenarios too. Like it could be that just that we're, you know, ultimately thinking about evaluating some policy that we think is going to accelerate science, like improving replications or something. But over time, science and the broader ecosystem evolves in a way that actually the way that we're incentivizing replications has now become like an albatross around the neck. And so like the what was a good policy has like become a bad policy. Then a third reason is like just there could be these crazy changes to the state of the world. There could be disasters that happen, uh, like super volcanoes, uh, you know, meteorite impacts, nuclear war, out of control climate change. And if any of that happens, maybe you get to the point now where like, 
you know, our little science policy, meta science policy stuff doesn't matter anymore. Like we got way bigger fish to fry and like the return is, is zero because nobody's doing science anymore. Uh, it could also be that the world evolves in a way that, you know, the authorities that run the world, we actually don't like them. They don't share our values anymore. And now we're unhappy that they have better science. Um, <laughs> uh-huh. It could also be yeah. that like super transformative AI happens. Uh, so like the long story short is like the longer time goes on, the more likely it is that the world has sort of changed in a way that, you know, the impact of your policy, you don't know what the, you can't predict it anymore. And so the paper simplifies this, all these things. It doesn't care about all these specific things. Instead, it just says, we're going to invent this term called like an epistemic regime. And the idea is that if you're inside a regime, the future looks like the past. And so the past is a good guide to the future. And that's useful because, you know, we're saying things like 2% growth has historically occurred. We think it's going to keep occurring in the future. Health gains have looked this way. We think they're going to look this way in the future. As long as you're inside this regime, that's sort of a, we're going to say that's, that's a valid choice. And then every period, there's some every year, there's some small probability the world changes in into a new epistemic regime where all bets are off and like the previous stuff is no longer a good guide. And how it could change could be any of those kinds of scenarios that we came up with. Then the choice of discount rate becomes like, what's the probability that you think the world is going to change so much that historical trends are no longer a useful guide? And we co- I settle on two percent per year, like a one in 50 chance. And where does that come from? You know, there was, uh, Open Phil had this AI worldviews contest where people, there was sort of a panel of people judging what would the probability of transformative AI happening. And that gave you a spread of people's views about what's the probability we get transformative AI by certain years. And on, you know, something, you get something a little less than 2% per year is the probability if you look in the middle of that. Then Toby Ord, you know, has this famous book, The Precipice, and in there he has some forecasts about X risk that is, you know, not derived from AI, but that kind of covers some of those disasters. I also looked at like there's been sort of trend breaks in the history of economic growth since there's sort of been one since the Industrial Revolution, and maybe we expect something like that. Anyway, we settle on sort of a two percent rate and. The bottom line is that we're sort of saying people in the distant future in this model don't count for much of anything in this model. Uh, but it's not because they don't we don't care about them. It's just that we have no idea how to help, like if what we will do will help or hurt their situation. Another way to think of two percent is that like on average every fifty years or so the world changes so much that like you can't predict you can't use historical trends to extrapolate. How technology generates huge benefits in our day-to-day lives. I've had 40 years of technological progress in my lifetime. And if you use the framework we use to evaluate this, in this model, it should it says like, you know, if progress is 1% per year, my life should be like 20 to 30% better than if I was my age now 40 years ago. And so I like thought like all right, does it seem plausible that technological progress for me has generated like a 20 to 30% improvement? And like so I, I spent like a I don't know, a while thinking about this and I think like yeah, it is actually like very plausible and it's sort of an interesting exercise because it also sort of helps you realize why it, maybe it's hard to see that value. Like one is it affects the the amount of time I have to do different kinds of things. And when you're remembering back, you don't remember that you spent three hours vacuuming versus like one hour vacuuming or something. You just remember you you were vacuuming. And so it kind of compresses the time and so you lose that. Right. And then also there's just so many little things that happened that it's hard to sort of like, it's like it's easy to evaluate like one big impact thing because you can imagine if I had it or I didn't. But when it's just like a thousand little things, it's harder to evaluate. But like... Do you want to hear like a list of yeah, absolutely. a lot of little things? All right. <laughs> yeah, so like uh like start like with little trivial things. Like uh I like to work in a coffee shop and because of like the internet and all the technology that came with like computing, I can work remotely in a coffee shop most days for part of the day. Uh I like digital photography. These are just like trivial things. And like, you know, not only do I like taking them, but like I've got them on my phone. The algorithm's always showing me a new photo every hour. My kids and I look through our pictures of our lives like way more often than when I was a kid looking at like photo albums. A little bit less trivial is like art, right? Like, so my access to some kind of art is way higher than if I'd lived 40 years ago. Like the Spotify, you know, wrapped came out a couple, I don't know, in November. And I like was like, oh man, I spent apparently like 15% of my waking hours listening to like 
music by it said like a thousand different artists. Wow. Uh, similarly, like with movies, I'm, I'm like watching lots of movies that would be hard to access in the past. Another sort of dimension of life is like learning about the world. I think learning is a great thing. And like one, we just know a lot more about the world, sort of through the mechanisms we just through science and technology and stuff. But there's also been like this huge proliferation of sort of like ways to ingest and like learn that information in a way that's useful to you. So there's uh, podcasts where you can have people come on and explain things, uh, but there's data, there's like explainers, there's like data visualization is way better, uh, YouTube videos, large language models are like a new thing and so forth. And like there's living literature reviews, which is like what I write. So like my whole like a third of like what I spend my time doing didn't exist like 40 years ago. Another dimension that life is like worth living and valuable is like your social connections and so on. And for me, like remote work has made a big difference for that. Like uh, I grew up in Iowa. I have lots of friends and family in Iowa. Like, and Iowa is not like the hot spot of economics of innovation stuff necessarily. <laughs> but I, I live here. I work remotely for uh, you know Open Phil, which is based in San Francisco. And then remote work also has like these time effects. So. You know, uh, I used to commute uh, for my work, 45 minutes a day, each way. And so, like, that was, I was a teacher, a professor, so that was not all the time. I had the summers off and so on. But anyway, still, saving 90 minutes a day, you know, that's like a form of life extension that, like, we don't normally think of as, like, life extension, but it's extending my time, okay? And then there's, like, tons of other things that have the same effect, where they just free up time. So it's like, I used to, when I was a kid, drive and go shop, like, walk shop floors a lot, to like get the stuff with my parents that you need. Now we have like online shopping and a lot of like the sort of mundane stuff is like just comes to our house shipped, it's automated and stuff. We've got a more fuel efficient car. We're not going to the gas station as much. We've got microwave steamable vegetables that like I use uh, instead of cooking uh, in a pot and stuff. Uh, we've got like a electric snowblower. It doesn't need seasonal maintenance. Just like a billion tiny little things. Like every time I tap to pay, I'm saving like maybe a second or something. Uh, and then I, like once added up with the remote work, the shopping, I, was, I think this is like giving me weeks per year of stuff wow. that I wouldn't be doing. But then like, <laughs> I can keep going. So there's like, it's not just that like you have, you don't have to do stuff that you wouldn't normally do. There's other times when like you've got some weird, you know, it helps you make better use of time that uh, might otherwise sort of not be available to you. So like all these odd little moments that you're like waiting for the bus or for the driver to get here, for the kettle to boil, the doctor office, whatever, you you could be on your phone, and if you're, you know, that's on you, how you use that time, but you have the option to sort of learn more and do interesting stuff. Uh, audio content, the same, like uh, for like a decade, half the books I've quote unquote read per year have been like audio books and, you know, podcasts. And so I'm sure maybe there's people listening to this podcast right now while they're doing something that they otherwise normally would not be able to like learn anything about the world. So they're driving or walking or doing the dishes or folding laundry or something like that. So that's sort of like all the just tons of tiny little things. And this is just setting aside medicine, which is like <laughs> equally valuable to all that stuff, right? Like not being, I, I've been lucky in that I haven't had like life-threatening illnesses, but I know people who would be dead if not for like advances in the 40 years. And they're still in my lives because of, you know, this stuff. And then I benefited like everyone else from the mRNA vaccines that sort of ended lockdown and so forth. So long story short, it seems very plausible to me that like a 20 to 30, like the, the framework we're using, which says this should be worth 20 to 30% of my well-being, seems plausible over a 40-year lifespan. Uh, I'm luckier than some people in some respects, but I've also benefited less than other people in some respects. Like if somebody had a medical emergency that they wouldn't be alive here today, they could say that they benefited more from science than me. And so if this is happening to lots of people now and in the future, you know, that's where I start to think like $70 per dollar in value starts to seem plausible. Can science reduce extinction risk? One interesting kind of theoretical argument is that if you discover some kind of really advanced scientific solution to problems, uh, a huge group like governments can coordinate around it. You can get a you can get the world to coordinate around making this thing happen, like making mRNA vaccines or something. Um, right. And faster science could basically tilt the balance so that we have more of those kind of frontier things available to these big actors. Uh, and presumably that kind of cutting edge stuff that takes the coordination of hundreds or thousands of people wouldn't be available to sort of bad actors. But 
I ended up coming away a little bit pessimistic about this route just because the kind of reduction in risk that you need to hit seemed really large. And so the way I looked at this was I thought rather than pausing science for a year and evaluating that, it was sort of like what's what if you got an extra year of science somehow through efficiency gains, you know, the equivalent of an extra year. And that was a, that allowed you to reduce by some percentage or some amount the sort of danger from this time of perils. How big would that need to be? And I thought like a reasonable benchmark is however much we reduce all cause death per year, you know, like that's what science is sort of trying to figure out now. We have a bunch of scientists working on it, uh, so we can and we can look at how much life expectancy tends to go up each year. So that's like just a, a ballpark place to start. And if that's kind of what you get from an extra year, like you reduce the annual probability of death by some small amount, and now you apply that to this these estimates from the super forecasters or the domain experts. Well, it's just it's just not big enough to hmm. to make a difference. Like it, it just sort of. It it doesn't move the needle very much on this in this model. Is that really kind of the best we could do, though? If we if we tried really hard to do better science, like if we had some sense of what the risks were, and and we have at least some sense, could better science just be like really, really, really targeted at making sure those risks don't play out? I mean, I think it is possible, and so like I don't say that this is like you know, definitive or anything. But I say like uh-huh. it would need to be better than we're doing against sort of the suite of natural problems that are arising. Now, like, so I'll give you two reasons. I'll give you a reason why uh, to be optimistic and a reason to be pessimistic. So a reason to be optimistic is that we actually do have like pretty good evidence that science can respond rapidly to like new problems. So when COVID-19 hit, like prior to COVID-19, like the number of people doing research on that kind of disease was like, you know, all but zero. Afterwards, like one in 20 papers, there's like this, this is a, based on a paper by Ryan Hill and other people. Uh, one in 20 papers was like in some way related to COVID. And so basically the entire, you know, 25% of the scientific ecosystem, which is a huge number of people, pivoted to starting to sort of work on this. Um, you can see similar kinds of responses in other domains too, like um, the funding for different institutes in the National Institute for Health tends to be very steady and just sort of goes up with inflation or whatever and, you know, uh, doesn't move around very much. Uh, But there were like three times when it moved around quite a lot in the last sort of several decades. One was in response to the AIDS crisis uh, and another was after 9-11 when there was a lot of fears about bioterrorism. And so these both are examples of sort of something big and salient happened and the ecosystem did change and pour a lot of resources into trying to solve those problems. Kind of the counter argument though, like why you might want to be pessimistic is like it took a long time to, you know, sort out AIDS, for example. And in general, even though science can begin working on a problem really quickly, that doesn't mean that a solution will always be quick in arriving. And you know, throughout the report, we sort of assume that the benefits from science take 20 years before they sort of turn into some kind of technology. And that's under normal science, not kind of any kind of accelerated crisis thing. And then they take even longer to spill out over the rest of the world. So, you know, the mRNA vaccines that ended COVID quickly, the research that was underlying that had been had been going on for decades earlier. It wasn't like COVID hit and then we were like, we got to do all this work to try to figure out how to solve it. Right. Are we already too late to delay the time of perils? So in theory, the time of perils might be decades from now and pausing science would, in fact, meaningfully delay its start. But I guess it also seems possible given the time it takes for technology to diffuse and maybe some other things that uh, that we could just already be too late. That's right. Yeah. And so that's another kind of additional analysis we look at in in the report is that, as you said, we could be too late for a lot of reasons. Um, One simple scenario is that all of the all of the know-how about how to develop dangerous genetically engineered pathogens is sort of already out there it's latent in the scientific corpus and ai advances are just sort of going to keep on moving forward whether or not we do anything with science policy it's sort of is ha- it's driven by other things like what's going on in open ai or deep mind and eventually mm-hmm. that's going to be advanced enough to sort of organize and walk somebody through how to use this knowledge that's already out there and so that's one risk is that actually 
you know, it hasn't happened yet, but sort of there's nothing left to be discovered that would be right. decisive in this question. Would that mean we're just already in the time of perils? You know, the time of perils is this framework, right? That how you estimate like the probability. And if you would want to bring that forward, technically we wouldn't be in it, but we would be too late to sort of stop it. Like it's coming at a certain point. And I, I guess this is also a useful point to say like, it doesn't have to actually be this discrete thing where like we're out and then we're in. It could be this smooth thing, but like uh, it gets like riskier and riskier over time. And this whole paper is sort of like a a bounding exercise. Like this is a simple way to approach it that I think will tend to give you like the same flavor results as if you assume something more complicated. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And so I guess just being in this kind of time of heightened risk doesn't guarantee anything terrible. So in theory, like we still want to keep doing, we still want to figure out what the right policy is. So if we're in that world where we're too late to pause science, what exactly is the policy implication from your perspective? Yeah. I mean, I think it's like, basically there's this quote from Winston Churchill, like if you're going through hell, keep going. And so, you know, (laughs) we're in a bad place. Uh, And there's no downside to science in this world, right? Like uh, if you think things can't get worse, if you think that the the worst stuff has already been discovered and it's just waiting to be deployed. Well, then then you kind of kind of bet on if we accelerate science. There's all these normal benefits that we would get. Um, it's not going to get worse because that's already sort of that that die has already been cast. And maybe there is a way to get to the other side and so forth. So I think that's the implication. And that's it. It's sort of a bad it's a bad place to be, but at least it's clear from a policy perspective what the right thing to do is. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a view on whether we are, in fact, already too late? Uh, I'm, you know, not a biologist, economist, but it's another one where I'm like, I don't know, 50 <laughs> 50. Okay. The omnipresent frictions that might prevent explosive economic growth. Kind of factors that can matter is like, it might take time to collect certain kinds of data. It takes, like, you think of like a lot of, um, AI advances are based on like self play, like the computer, you know, uh, AlphaGo or like chess. They're, they're sort of self playing and they can really rapidly play like a ton of games and, and learn skills. Um, if you want to try to sort, if you, if you imagine like what is the equivalent of that in the physical world, well, we don't have a good enough model of the physical world where you can kind of self play. You actually have to go into the physical world and try the thing out and see if it works. And if it's like testing a new drug, that takes a long time to see the effects. So there's time. Uh, it could be about access to getting specific materials or maybe physical capabilities. It could be about access to data. You could imagine that if people are seeing jobs are getting obsoleted, then why they could maybe refuse to share uh, and cooperate with sharing the data needed to train uh, on that stuff. There's social relationships people have with each other. There's trust when they're deciding who to work with and so forth. And if there's alignment issues, that could be another potential issue. Uh, there's incentives that like uh, people might have. There's also like people might be in conflict with each other and be able to use AI to sort of try to thwart each other. Like you can imagine legislating over the use of IP, intellectual property rights, and you know people on both sides using AI to like not make the process go much faster because they're both deploying a lot of resources at it. And so the the sort of short answer is if there's lots of these kind of frictions and like any particular application, I think you see this a lot in like attempts to apply. Uh, AI advances to any particular domain. Like, oh, it turns out there's like a lot of sector-specific detail that had to be ironed out. And there's kind of this hope that those problems will will sort of disappear at some stage. And maybe they won't, basically. Um, you know, I think that like one example that I've been thinking about recently with this is like, imagine if there were like, if we achieved AGI and we could deploy 100 billion digital scientists and they were really effective and they could discover and tell us, here are the blueprints for technologies that you won't invent for 50 years. So you just build these and you're going to leap 50 years into the future in the, in the space of one year. What happens there? Well, like this is not actually as unprecedented a situation as it seems. There's a lot of countries in the world that are 50 years behind the USA, for example, in terms of the technology that is in wide use. And like, this is something we looked at, I I looked at in sort of updating this report. It's like, what are the average lags for technology adoption? And so why don't these countries just copy our technology and leap 50 years into the future? Uh, In fact, like, in some sense, they have an easier problem because 
they don't have to even build the technologies. They could, they don't have to bootstrap their way up. Like it's really hard to make advanced semiconductors because you have to build the fabs, which take lots of specialized skills themselves. But this this group, they don't even have to do that. They can just use the fabs that already exist to get the semiconductors and so forth. And leapfrog technologies that are sort of intermediate, like cellular technology instead of phone lines and stuff like that. And they can also borrow from the world to finance this investment. They don't have to sort of self-generate it. But that doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is because of tons of little frictions that have to do with things like incentives and so forth. And you know, you can say, well, that's there's there's very important differences between the typical country that is 50 years behind the USA and the USA, and maybe we would be able to actually just build the stuff. But like, I think you can look at, you know, who are the absolute best performers? They were in this situation, they changed their, you know, government, they got the right people in charge or something, and they just did this as good as you can do it, like the top mm-hmm. 1%. They don't have explosive economic growth. Like they don't converge to the US at 20% per year. You do very rarely observe people growing at 20% per year, but it is like always because they're a small country that discovers a lot of natural resources. It's not through this like process of technological upgrading. Mm-hmm. 